Okay, guys, this is going to be our oxygenation. Lecture. So, and I'm dividing it into two because I'm recording at home and there's a lot of background noise. So I'm um, sorry if there's too much, but hopefully it works out all right. So we're going to start with chapter 36, which is our oxygenation. These are our key terms for oxygenation. This is just a basic visualization of how your heart and lungs work together to provide your body with the oxygen that it needs and the blood that it needs. So oxygenation, right? The concept of oxygenation refers to how well the cells, tissue, and organs of the body are supplied with oxygen. These are the chapter's objectives and our two major processes that occur within the pulmonary system to oxygenate the blood is ventilation. And ventilation is going to be the movement of air in and out of the lungs. And then respiration is going to be the exchange of that oxygen with that carbon dioxide. And it's going to be at your capillary cell membrane level. So when we talk about our pulmonary system, we have our upper airways and our lower airways. And your upper airway is defined by that dotted line up there. Um, and then the lower airways is everything below. And we're going to move on to our alveoli. So when the lungs, um, when the air comes in through the mouth and it goes down to the trachea, and then it divides off into our um, airways. So up here, it starts in that oral and then it goes down and then it comes through your um, main stem branches. And then it ends up coming into here and it comes into these alveolar sacs. And then at the cellular level, we have our capillary network which provides the blue oxygenated with the red non-oxygenated and that exchange happens and the oxygenated blood goes back to the heart and the carbon dioxide is blown back through your lungs. So things that affect our ability to ventilate, we have our rate and our depth. So the rate is how fast we breathe and the depth is how much we expand our lungs to take air in. These processes affect oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in the blood. We have our lung compliance. This refers to the ease of the lung inflating. Normally the lungs inflate easily. Lung compliance is reduced by increased lung water. So like edema, loss of surfactant or conditions that cause elastin fibers in the lung to be replaced with scar tissue or collagen. We also have our lung elasticity. So that's the recoil. This refers to the tendency of the elastin fibers to return to their original position away from the chest wall after being stretched. So think of stretching a rubber band then letting it go. Alveoli that have been overstretched with like emphysema, and they lose their elastic recoil over time. The loss of elasticity allows the lungs to inflate easy, but inhibits the deflation, leaving stale trapped air in your alveoli. And then we have our airway resistance. And this is the resistance of the airflow within the airways. The larger diameter of the airway, the, the larger the diameter, the easier the air flows through it. So we have our respiration. And when we talk about respiration, it can be external respiration. And this is that alveolar capillary gas exchange. This occurs in the alveoli of the lungs. Your oxygen diffuses across the alveolar capillary membrane into the blood of the pulmonary capillaries. Carbon dioxide diffuses out of the blood and into the alveoli to be exhaled. External gets the CO2 out of the body. Then we have our internal respiration. This is going to be the capillary at that tissue gas exchange. So it occurs in the body organs and body tissues. Oxygen diffuses 
from the body through the capillary into your cellular membrane into the tissue where it is used for metabolism. This is gonna feed your organs oxygen. Then we have our control of breathing. So the respiratory centers in the brainstem control breathing using biofeedback from your chemical receptors and your lung receptors. We have voluntary control from our motor cortex that can override the involuntary respiration centers, but this is only temporary. This allows us to continue breathing while we're doing activities such as talking, singing, swallowing, whistling, blowing. Our chemoreceptors located in the medulla of the brainstem and the carotid arteries and the aorta detect changes in our pH, our oxygen, and our carbon dioxide levels. And they send messages back to the central respiratory center in the brain. In response, the respiratory center increases or decreases ventilation to maintain those normal blood pH O2 and CO2 levels. Normally the blood CO2 level provides the primary stimulus for us to breathe. And then we have our lung receptors. These are located in our chest and our lung. They're sensitive to breathing patterns, lung expansion, lung compliance, airway resistance, and respiratory irritants. The respiratory centers use feedback from the lung receptors to adjust our ventilation. Some factors that influence our pulmonary function we'll discuss over the next few slides. We can look at our lifespan and our development. Normally, development influences lungs, hearts, and circulatory function, all of which affect our oxygenation. Developmental factors have less effect on function in young and middle adults than in our older adults. Environment stressors like allergic reactions, altitude, and temperature all affect our oxygenation. When we talk about stress, this suppresses our immune system and our inflammatory response. A chronically suppressed immune and inflammatory response increase the risk for all infections, including those of the respiratory system. Our allergic reactions, specifically our pulmonary allergens, such as dust, dust mites, cockroach particles, pollen, tobacco spokes, and even sometimes food can affect our oxygenation and our pulmonary function. Altitude, lower oxygen levels at high altitudes can cause people to have hypoxemia and hypoxia. Lifestyle, we can have occupational exposures to habits. We can have smoking and other substances. With smoking, tobacco smoke constricts our bronchioles. It increases our fluid secretions into our airways. It causes inflammation and swelling of the bronchial lining, and it paralyzes the cilia, which kind of help get those secretions out. So we have more secretions, more inflammation that's restricting the secretions and a reduced ability to get it out. This all leads to a reduced airflow and increases our likelihood of having our infections. And then we can also have medications. Many medications can interfere with your pulmonary function and they can depress your respirations. Think about your opioids that can cause you to have respiratory distress. Respiratory depressants generally act by depressing your central nervous system, which inhibits the control of breathing by weakening the muscles. We can have upper respiratory infections. So going back to the upper airway slide, your upper airway infections are going to be in your sinuses, your nasal pharynx, or your epiglottal areas. So we're looking at things like the common cold or rhinosinusitis, pharyngitis, and even influenza can all impact our ability to have a nice, clear upper airway. And then we can have lower respiratory infections, things like RSV, acute bronchiolitis, even tuberculosis. All of those can affect your lower airway causing respiratory disease. Thinking of our tuberculosis, remember that if a patient has a positive PPD, it means that they've been exposed to tuberculosis, not that they're actively having tuberculosis. 
patients that are positive for TB need to be placed in that negative pressure airborne isolation. Somebody with just the common cold or influenza might need to be in droplet precautions. So factors that influence your pulmonary function. So we can have pulmonary system abnormalities. So something like a structural abnormality, airway inflammation or obstruction, alveolar capillary membrane disorders, atelectasis. We can have pulmonary circulation abnormalities. So like a pulmonary embolism, which is a clot or pulmonary hypertension. We can have central nervous system abnormalities, so somebody that had a stroke, maybe somebody that had trauma, so maybe somebody that had a spinal cord injury and the area below the injury, like their diaphragm is now paralyzed and they can no longer support their normal pulmonary function. We can have other muscular skeletal abnormalities um, that alter your central nervous system's function and interfere with our ability to regulate our breathing. So when we talk about the nursing process for oxygenation, what we're always going to start with is our assessment. So our assessment, we can do our physical assessment. So what's your patient's breathing pattern? Is it a normal breathing pattern of 12 to 20 breaths a minute? Is it tachypnic, where it's a fast breathing pattern greater than 24? Is it bradyapneic, where it's less than 10 breaths a minute? Are they apneic, where they're not having any breathing? Are they having Kuzmol's breathing? Are they having chain Stokes respirations. What's their overall respiratory effort? Are they tripoding where they have to lean forward and expand their, their chest walls so that they can actually get oxygen in? Are they speaking in one words? Are they not able to speak at all? Or are they talking in full sentences very rapidly? What's their pulse ox? Is their pulse ox showing that their hemoglobin is carrying oxygen down to their peripheral? What's their um, oscillation? What's their lung sound like? Um, do we see any crepitus? All of that stuff goes into assessing. So when we talk about high pitch, harsh sounding breath sounds, that is strider. Kusmals is gonna be that increased rate with an abnormally deep hyperventilation. And bodies typically do our Kuzmol respirations when it's trying to lower the blood pH. So when you get into diabetes and you talk about um, diabetic acidosis, those patients are going to be Kuzmol breathing. So other things that we can do to assess our oxygenation status, we can do some diagnostic testing, right? We can do a sputum sample. What kind, of, what kind of organism is causing this lung infection? Is it a pneumonia? Is it um, an RSV? Is it COVID? Is it some other SARS, right? So if we're doing our sputum sample, remember, we're going to want to make sure that patient's nice and hydrated because if they're not hydrated, that sputum turns to cement. And we want to make sure that we're teaching them to do deep breaths, nice deep breaths so that they can do a full cough. We don't want a little <clears throat> clear in the throat. You want that big <clears throat> to get that sputum out. We can do our skin testing. So again, that's that PPD for that TB test. Um, we can check the pulse ox. We know that that's going to be that... Um, non-invasive way of measuring your patient's oxygenation level. Uh, the American heart wants everybody's um, pulse ox to be above 94%. Anything less than that is showing an issue. We can have our capnography, which is going to be measuring your carbon dioxide in your inhaled and your exhaled. Um, capnography directly measures the ventilation and indirectly measures the patient's partial pressure of their CO2 in their arterial blood. We can do spirometry, which is gonna measure the air that moves in and out of the lungs. We can do our ABGs, which remember we talked about in fluid and electrolyte, where we're gonna be looking at what the patient's oxygen level is, what the patient's carbon dioxide level is, and what their pH is. And then we can do peak flow monitoring. And peak flow monitoring, we talked about in lab, 
And the peak fill is going to measure the amount of forceful air that they can exhale. It's typically something that we do in our asthmatic patients, because when patients have asthma, they're going to have the tightening of the airway. And because that airway is getting tight, they're not going to be able to forcibly get air out. So as we do breathing treatments, we typically trend tend to trend their peak flow. Um, patients that have been asthmatics for a long time usually know what their baseline peak flow is. Are different types of diagnoses and concepts. So if you're looking off your conceptual care plan book, you just have oxygenation. It makes it very easy on you. If you're going into your F.A. Davis book and you're looking at your different diagnoses, it kind of breaks it up into, is this an airway issue, right? And whenever we talk about oxygenation and our ABCs, we always want to start with airway because if, if you do not have a good airway, then you're not going to be able to have any type of ventilation, right? Because if you can't get it in, there's no way for it to get spread around your body. Um, then we can look at our breathing patterns. Is it a gas exchange issue? Um, is it an aspiration issue, right? And then our interventions, our, our big scope is always going to be for optimal oxygenation. So we might have to administer respiratory medications, right? We might do a bronchial dilator, something that's going to open the airway up. We might use some type of anti-inflammatory agent like a steroid to help reduce the inflammation in the lungs. We might need to use a cough suppressant so that the patient can get some relief from constant coughing. We might need an expectorant, something that's going to help get that mucoid to break mucus to break up and come out. We might do a decongestant to dry up that nasal passageway. We need to make sure that if we're doing over-the-counter medications that the patients are aware of the risks and the side effects. A lot of your decongestions can give patients palpitations. We know that our anti-inflammatory agents can potentially impact their kidneys. So those are all things that we need to just be mindful of when we're doing um, different types of respiratory medications um, and alternative respiratory therapy medications. And then we might have to put our patient on the mechanical ventilator, right? And you're going to learn about more about mechanical ventilators in MedSearch too, but we need to know that, you know, that that is a ventilator is the breathing machine. It's going to be for somebody who's intubated or for somebody that has a tracheostomy tube. And that's going to be connected to an oxygen tube to a ventilator that's going to be pushing air into them. Um, a lot of patients will have advanced directives that say that they do not want to go on life support. A ventilator is considered life support. And then we might also have a chest tube. And again, chest tube systems, you're going to learn more about in MedSearch 2 and MedSearch 3. The purpose of a chest tube is to either remove air or fluid from the pleural space and allow the lung to re-expand. Um, these collection chambers have special treatments, special care measurements, and tons of stuff that you need to do when you're taking care of them. And you'll go over that in the future. So more interventions that we can do for optimal oxygenation. We want to promote our respiratory function. So things that we can do is we can do preventative care, right? We can get our patients to have the proper vaccines. So um, pneumonia vaccine, we might do COVID-19 vaccines. You might do a flu vaccine. All of those things can help reduce the risk of infections, um, pneumonia, and um, we can also do smoking sensation because we know that once we stop smoking, the lungs start to repair themselves positioning our patients, right? So if we position our patient so that we're promoting drainage of the lung, you want the bad lung to be up. If we want the patient to be able to breathe a little bit easier, sometimes we want the good lung up because if, if we put the bad lung on top, the bad lung is going to compress the good lung and make it a little bit harder for the patient to breathe. Um, we can use incentive spirometers. So those are going to be helpful in encouraging our patients to take deep breaths. We should have a goal of the amount of air volume that they should be getting in. It's going to help to reduce atelectasis. 
and reduce our chances of pneumonia, especially for our patients who are recently had surgery or have been on prolonged bed rest. Another thing that I want to say real quick about position is anytime you have somebody who's having any shortness of breath, the best thing that you can do for that patient is set them up. Um, don't forget that. It's easier to breathe sitting up than it is laying flat. And then the final um, thing on this slide that we can talk about is our aspiration precautions. Remember patients that are increased risk for aspiration. We just talked about when we did our nutritional. So it's going to be those that are at a decreased level of conscious, maybe somebody who had a stroke, anybody that has a diminished gag reflex or cough reflex, anybody who has difficulty swallowing. Um, we should always make sure that we have suction available at the bedside for patients that are aspiration precaution. And we want to prevent aspiration um, by our positionings, our feedings, and having our suction available. We can also help mobilize our secretions. So Again, with our deep breathing and coughing, making sure our patient is adequately hydrated and chest physiotherapy, which is kind of that um, cupping per on the back and um, it kind of helps to um, get the vibrations to break things up so that patients can expectorate it a little bit easier. Um, a lot of your respiratory therapists are really good at doing this and they actually have some beds now that have it built into it. We can also use oxygen therapy. So our non-invasive oxygen therapies, we can do our nasal cannula. Now, if we're doing a cannula, we need to make sure that the maximum amount is going to be six liters. Anything above three liters needs to be humidified. And we need our patient to be able to use it adequately. So if I'm somebody who's a mouth breather, nasal cannula is not going to work for me. If I'm somebody who has a lot of nasal secretions, if I clear the secretions out and they're gone, nasal cannula could work. But if I clear the secretions out and more just come back, nasal cannula is not going to work for me. We can also have our masks. So you can have just a simple mask, which you can dial up just like you would dial up nasal cannula. So you can have six liters on a simple mask. You can have a venti mask, which gives you a more prescribed amount of oxygen. So remember in lab, we had those and you had to look at what the venti mask needed as far as leaders and make sure that you had it dialed to the right location on both the mask end as well as on the wall end. And if the patient um, accidentally covered up some of those holes, they would get more oxygen. So those can be difficult to work with. And then we also have our non-rebreather masks. And we know that a non-rebreather mask is gonna give 100% of oxygen. Um, however, we have our additional precautions that we have to have with that, making sure that that reservoir bag is completely filled. And that one of those little um, side vents are open so that the patient doesn't suffocate in there. Um, and then our trans tracheal catheters. So these are like our trach collars. Trach collars always need to be humidified because you remember our humidification takes place through our nasal passages and from our mouth. So if we're not getting humidification there, then our lungs are going to get dry. And we don't want a patient with a trach getting dry in that trachea because if that starts to bleed, that's just a whole debacle mess on its own. Um, and with our trachs, we also need to make sure that when we're suctioning those, those are sterile. Anything in your lower airway is considered sterile. And then we have this question, um, talking about our artificial airways. So your oral pharyngeal, oh, oral pharyngeal airway, um, that's going to be the mouth. This cannot be used in an unconscious patient who has a gag. It will cause the patient to gag. Um, it also shouldn't be used if somebody is potential for having a laryngeal spasm. So we know our smokers are at increased risk for laryngeal spasm. Um, they're kind of siege in shape. They're hard plastic devices. To get your appropriate size, you have to go from um, their front teeth to the end of their jawline. And there's an image in your book about that. 
your nasopharyngeal airway um, is going to be that soft. It's going to go through the nostril down into the pharynx area. This is good for your semi-conscious patients. It's okay if they have a gag because it does not stimulate the gag reflex. And these are really helpful if you're having to do a lot of suctioning on your patients. Um, our endotracheal, so these are going to be your patients who are intubated and they're put on the life support, the ventilators. So your endotracheal tubes can go in your oral cavity. They can go in your nasal cavity. And then you can also, you don't, it's not, they can do a tracheostomy um, for that as well. So our oral is through the mouth. That's the most commonly seen. Um, if your patient is nasally intubated, it's convenient because they can no longer, they can't bite it. Um, however, anytime we pack somebody's nose, they have to go on antibiotics. So you need to advocate for that. And then our tracheostomies is going to be through that trach, so through that neck. That is very important to maintain patency on. Um, you'll learn about doing sterile trach dressings when you get into med surge one. You'll learn about trach suctioning when you get into med surge one. And that is our last question. And that is actually it for oxygenation. So thank you.